Hello and welcome to the lecture on ILM 310305B Process Loop Dynamics, part of the third year instrumentation course at RDP. Let's start the lecture, shall we? In this ILM, our objectives are to introduce you to some common uh, loop dynamics and how the different uh, responses of loops to the effects of essentially frequency is what we cover in this particular ILM. Our objectives explain the behavior of an open loop system to a frequency input. We will then carry on to explain the open loop frequency response for each of the process types that we have addressed in earlier ILMs. So we'll look at the frequency response and its effects on a dead time process, a integrating process, a first order process, and a multi-capacity process. As we go through the lecture, uh, pay attention to the uh, distinctive qualities uh, of the individual processes, as well as some of the commonalities uh, that are shared between the individual processes as we uh, deal with their reactions to uh, frequency responses. So we're going to learn how the frequency of disturbances affects the gain of the process and how it affects the frequency phase. So the frequency of disturbances simply means how often it happens. Uh, and this is important in process control um, because in order to maintain uh, control, we have to be able to have the control system react in a timely enough manner to affect the output and counteract any change that was introduced as error and make it go away. Um, so if the frequency uh, increases or decreases, it changes the ability of a loop to respond properly. It also uh, changes the dynamics uh, of the loop response. And that's what we're going to be uh, looking at throughout this ILM. So some of the common things that we are going to be uh, dealing with in this ILM, some common terms here are P, U, uh, which stands for ultimate period, and it's basically the period of oscillation or a uh, peak to peak time for you electricians out there. Um, that's one of the uh, key variables that we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, net change in, in overall gain. So on a closed loop uh, sine wave representation like we have here, uh, there's a few different ways. Uh, that you can find this gain value, but it's essentially a peak to peak um, value vertically here. So in this example here, uh, baseline at 50% and we're uh, wiggling off, off base here a little bit by about 2.7% versus this graph here, uh, which from peak to peak here, uh, two squares is 10%. So we'll be using a familiar calculation uh, for dynamic gain that is the output uh, over the input again here, uh, in this case represented by uh, B and A or 2.7 and 10, giving us a gain of 0.27. So as we go through the different examples of the processes, um, you're going to see how the um, rate of change or the frequency of change affects the dynamic gain as well as another variable, which is over here, uh, the time delay, which is um, the amount of time that it takes for uh, the output to respond uh, to the input change. And it's a, a variable that's associated with uh, lag and dead time. Uh, and we'll see how uh, frequency changes uh, affect this amount of phase shift or how far or how uh, behind um, our response is in, in regard to the 
the call for change that we're getting from uh, the input. So if these are uh, really the, the few things that we're going to be looking at in the ILM, the, the relationship between this time delay and dynamic gain as the uh, input frequency to a process changes and affects uh, the output's ability to maintain control. So it's a lot of information in here, um, but it all boils down to a, a relatively straightforward matrix. Um, you could probably draw a matrix with the four different type loop responses in there, uh, have an inc increasing frequency column, a decreasing frequency column, and then effect on uh, phase shift and effect on dynamic gain. And you can make yourself a real nice little study chart uh, if you wanted to do something like that. So talking about disturbances and how uh, they affect how a process operates, it's uh, to put it into something maybe a little easier to wrap your head around here. It's not much different than trying to get work done uh, when someone is always changing their mind. Um, if direction is given to us and that direction doesn't change, there's a good chance that we're going to get to where we want to be or we're going to accomplish our task or get our work done. If the directions, however, are always changing, um, the work may never get done at all. It ultimately affects our per performance and output and processes uh, are the same. In uh, the normal classroom lecture, I would use a scenario here where uh, you and a friend are, are uh, moving all your furniture into a, a new house and your wife is giving you uh, guidance or your significant other is giving you guidance to where to put the furniture. So you go up to the truck and you, you grab a couch and you bring it into the house and she says, I want it over there on the, on the wall under the windows. And you start carrying it over there and you're just about to set it down. And she says, no, 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 actually, I don't want it on that wall. I want it on the, I want it on the wall over there next to the fireplace. So you pick it up and you start moving it over there. And she says, ah, no, 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 actually, I want it over here. The frequency of her changes is so fast that you're not getting any work done at all. You're just chasing your tail basically uh, and, and not accomplishing anything. Whereas if she had given you one direction and stuck with it, you would have fulfilled your task and kept on uh, on task. And, and processes are really the same, the same way. Okay, um, page two here tells us about a, a step input response test uh, that allows us to model a process. And we've done some of these step response tests uh, in earlier ILMs, allowing us to find out our, our T1 times and our dead times and our overall gains and things like that. Um, in order to, uh, to do this, we'll be using a sinusoidal uh, shaped input, which allows us to see the process's frequency response. Um, and the response that we're going to see as we move forward here is different uh, depending on the input frequency. So two parameters, again, that are going to be used to describe this response are the dynamic gain or the change in output or input, and then that time delay uh, or phase shift, which is uh, the difference between when the change occurred and the resulting uh, reaction to that change. Okay, so again, dynamic gain uh, indicates amplitude of the oscillations being larger or smaller, so smaller oscillations and larger oscillations. And the phase shift represents the delay from the input to the output. So you see here uh, this delay um, from the input to the output in this case is uh, 0.82 minutes. So these are the two basic formulas that we're going to be using as we move uh, through the ILM. What's going to be happening is our frequency, or our ultimate period uh, times are going to change uh, and this is going to have an effect on uh, what happens here in terms of phase shift and its ability to uh, meet its gain or get its work done. Okay, um, a dynamic gain less than one, and this isn't actually in the ILM, uh, anymore, but this is something that you want to uh, kind of store away in the back of your head for a little bit later on. Um, a dynamic gain less than one signifies that the output oscillations are smaller than the input one. Okay, a dynamic gain equal to one will signify the output oscillations are equal to the input one, and a dynamic gain that's greater than one signifies the output oscillations are larger than the input one. Um, three different situations. 
Uh, the ideal situation for us is to have a dynamic gain that's less than one, which means that our oscillations will consistently decrease in amplitude, uh, eventually reaching a new static state. Uh, a dynamic gain equal to one means that the uh, process response to our input change is going to be exactly the same, multiplied by one. And a dynamic gain greater than one means that our input change is going to be multiplied by a larger number than one, which means the oscillations are going to be uh, larger than our input uh, oscillations. So this gain and phase shift will change as the frequency changes. It is a live beast, for lack of better words. Um, we can calculate the gain and the shift from our old friends, the transfer functions. Okay, phase shift, uh, fairly easy calculation, anyway, a fairly easy formula anyway to calculate the degree of phase shift. We use this formula here, which is the time delay over the ultimate period multiplied by 360 degrees. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, which represents the, the full uh, cycle of a, of a sine wave here. PU, uh, again, the oscillation of one cycle. And if we use the example uh, here, 0.82 minutes is our time delay, two minutes is our PU, and we multiply that by 360 degrees, the amount of possible uh, phase shift or uh, rotation in the, in the sine wave. And we see that we end up with a number of 148 degrees. So in this example, a phase shift 100 of 148 degrees is 0.82 minutes delayed, which would mean in this case, if we wanted to just put this aside for a second, 360 degrees means that we're two minutes delayed in response and 180 degree shift would be a one minute delay in response. Um, and it's again, relatively uh, simple math. This is uh, pretty much the math um, that you are expected to do. Uh, in this ILM, uh, we'll just be changing some of the data in the graphs. Okay, we're going to start out by looking at low frequency inputs. So again, this is like being told to do something and having a lot of time uh, to do it before uh, someone tells you to do something else. So it's a low frequency input. Uh, we're going to use this particular transfer function just picked out of the ILM as it is. Uh, again, you can see by looking at it, it's a first order plus dead time uh, transfer function, uh, gain of one, dead time of uh, 1.5, and a T1 time of three. Our graph over here, you'll see uh, low frequency, uh, ultimate period is eight hours, so one cycle uh, every eight hours, so indeed a very low, uh, very low frequency here. Um, the process time constant is 4.5 uh, units. I guess it, that should actually be hours, not minutes, but uh, it should be 4.5. And again, that's a combination of uh, this 1.5 and the 3, which means uh, that if nothing in changes in eight hours, the process has tons of time to reach its set point and its full gain with no phase shift. The idea here is if the uh, input change occurs every eight hours, I can get my work done as long as my next instruction comes in a time less than eight hours. And in this case, it would be four and a half hours. So that tells me that I can totally get my work done in the allotted amount of time given this transfer function. So the resulting uh, sine waves that come from uh, this example are our uh, eight hour peak to peak um, cycle on our input and our output response, which exactly follows uh, our input sine wave here. Uh, our gain, A versus B, uh, both 10 over 10 here equaling one. And you'll see here, uh, we make our change here and the output response immediately changes at the exact same time. So we have no time delay whatsoever. So this is really a, a fairly ideal situation. Um, we have no phase shift, so we're not behind in any work whatsoever, and we have plenty of time to do it, meaning that we get the work accomplished uh, as, as we should. Compare now uh, to a higher frequency input using the same uh, transfer uh, equation here. Our input frequency is two seconds, uh, which is a very short time. So our PU right here is two seconds. Uh, we've already determined that it takes uh, at least 4.5 uh, units uh, 
to uh, match this particular transfer function here. Um, so the process time constant is 4.5. I guess we just leave it at minutes. It really is kind of irrelevant. Um, but it's large in relation uh, to this two seconds, right? This is two seconds. It takes me four and a half minutes to do the job, and the wife is telling me to change every two seconds. So what happens when, when that situation occurs? This means in two seconds, the process has no time to reach its set point and its full gain. The waveform uh, of the output, as you can see, shows that it can't respond fast enough to work. Um, and this is a, a big dramatization, I guess, but this is uh, illustrating the fact that uh, decisions are, or direction is being changed so frequently, way faster than I can do my work, that nothing actually gets done. So high frequency is uh, the worst case scenario. Now, if we look at an intermediate frequency, given the same transfer function here, uh, and we'll, we'll talk in minutes this time just to keep everything great because graphs in minutes. Uh, our input frequency, as you see here, our, peer, our PU is uh, six minutes. Uh, our time constant here is still uh, 4.5 or 4.5 minutes, which means that I almost get everything going on here. So let's see, it says, it means that the process nearly reaches its set point and its full gain, but not quite, right? It nearly goes up 5%, it doesn't, it only goes up, you know, that much compared to, to this much. Um, and we got some time delay in here, and that's the difference between uh, this peak and this peak. It's the easiest way to measure it is from uh, peak to peak. Um, so the input changes direction before the output reaches its peak. The, old, uh, the phase shift can be calculated as we did before. So again here, our input change was 10% uh, overall change here. Our output response change was uh, about 3%. So we can calculate our dynamic gain at 0.3. Uh, and we can also look at this graph. Um, and again, it's easiest to pick the top of a peak because um, there's not much reference over here. Um, so peak to peak here, 2.7 minutes. So we do 2.7 minutes over six minutes times 360. And that would tell us uh, how many degrees of leg uh, we have. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, those things now uh, in, uh, in terms of the different processes uh, that we discussed in the previous ILM. So starting out with dead time frequency responses, um, I'm not getting into the uh, super dirty, dirty details here, um, but it's most important, I think, in this ILM to understand the characteristics uh, associated uh, with the particular processes. And I'll point out some uh, interesting characteristics or notable characteristics uh, as we go through these slides here. So, um, as a fact, dead time will create a phase shift or lag relative to the input. That should be a no brainer because we know dead time has dead time. So, it's going to be there. So, that hopefully ties something in there for you and maybe make a light click or something like that. Uh, the ratio of the dead time to the alternate period will give us the uh, exact phase shift in degrees and the gain will not change for dead time processes. So there's two facts here associated specifically with a dead time process. The one is that the gain will not change for a dead time process, just a fact. And we will indeed have a phase shift for dead time. So again, we can do our calculations here. Uh, one minute over eight minutes times 360 uh, is 45 degrees of phase shift. And uh, does that represent very well? Um, we will say no. But uh, that's dead time. And we're not going to look, I don't think, at much more than that. Oh, yeah, a little bit more. <clears throat> Okay, here's uh, another example, just uh, another math example here. Um, this example here, we have a uh, time delay of one minute, an ultimate period of two minutes. So one over two times 360 is 180 degrees of phase shift. Remember, let's see, we're at eight minutes, ultimate period here, two minute ultimate period here. So what's happening is our frequency uh, is changing, it's going up. <clears throat> and we see that we're getting phase shift, which is varying with frequency. And for a dead time process, the phase shift can be anywhere between zero and an infinite number of degrees. 
um, remember this. Um, this is a pretty key point and every process that we look at moving forward here will have a similar uh, statement to this uh, specific to the process type. Okay, and as we said in the previous slide, gain is not affected for dead time processes. And you can see that here by the 10% uh, swing in the input and the 10% swing in the output and our gain uh, being one there. Integrating processes, a um, little different again, of course, because they're because they are different. Uh, an integrating process, the time delay is always 25% of the ultimate period. That's a fact. Nothing to change it. Eight minutes here, two minutes here. Okay. Um, the way it works here, if you were to have a look at the uh, graphs here, that the inflow is greater than the outflow half of the time. Um, basically, I'm saying our input is increasing this much here. This starts a little bit behind it, 45 degrees of behind it basically, and then it starts increasing. It's still increasing at this point in time, but our input is now decreasing. So our input is decreasing while our output is still increasing. So that speaks to this inflow is greater than the outflow half of the time. You can see that relationship there. Uh, phase shift uh, is always 90 degrees for an integrating process, whereas uh, in the dead time process, process it was anywhere from uh, zero to infinity. And as frequency increases, the dynamic gain decreases. So dead time, no change to the dynamic gain, but with an integrating process, uh, an increase in frequency will cause a decrease in the gain. And you'll see that in all of the processes uh, moving forward. Um, that same characteristic applies. The uh, instructions change so fast, you don't get any work done. Uh, first order response here, just this has nothing to do with this ILM except for to scare you into uh, remembering what you just finished from uh, the other ILM. Uh, and to remind us that we're dealing with uh, two constants here, uh, T1 and KP, so nothing really uh, new there. Um, and still, it's all about PU and how it affects the gain and the phase shift here when we're talking about the first order uh, responses here. Oh, I didn't even add any comments. So uh, what do I got going on here? I guess I wasn't paying too much attention here. So our period and our time delay, again, used to calculate our phase shift, our, uh, our uh, <clears throat> output over our input, B over A here gives us our gain. And again, what we're looking for here is how does this frequency and this frequency of input affect our outputs here and you'll see commonalities now as we increase our frequency our phase shift uh, generally increases and our gain decreases and i guess we could do the math uh, you guys will probably do the math here uh, 0.4 over 2 uh, times 360 is i don't know somewhere close to 45 degrees uh, in this example here, and this is 1 over 8, which is uh, 0.125, which is like 22 and a half degrees. So you can see that a lower frequency has less phase shift, uh, higher frequency has more phase shift, and again, higher frequency, lower gain, lower frequency, higher gain. Those are the um, main objectives of this IOM, really, is to understand uh, what happens with these two factors uh, as we look at the different process types. Okay, last uh, but not least here, multi-capacity process. So again, that was uh, the distillation column was kind of the uh, standard um, example for a multi-capacity or a first order plus dead time process. Um, static gain, yeah, has gain in it, dead time, uh, T1 time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, the same calculations uh, that we did in the previous ILM, drop the line, get your dead time, your T1 time, all that wonderful stuff. Um, looking at the effect of frequency on uh, the gain and the phase shift for multi-capacity process. So here's the two graphs. 
uh, snipped out of the ILM, ILM again. Uh, the bottom graph, uh, low frequency input changes, uh, and you see that the uh, output graph uh, nearly reaches the same amount of gain in terms of the peak, right? So gain uh, is almost the same as our input, whereas the high frequency graph up here, we see uh, not even close, right? So again, frequency increases, gain goes down. Um, we're talking about phase shift here, uh, 0.82 minutes out of two minutes. Let's call that one over two or 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 360 is about 180 degrees of phase shift on the high frequency model. And let's do the low frequency model. Let's call this two over eight, which is a quarter times 360, uh, which is 90. So uh, lower uh, amount of phase shift uh, in this one. So you'll see very common, uh, very similar uh, to this example, uh, this example here as well. Long story short, uh, frequency increases for most processes mean that the gain is going to go down and the phase shift is going to go up. And that is for most of them except for dead time. Uh, what's this one here? Multi capacity, multi capacity, yeah, same thing. Okay, so. Again, just to reiterate what we said before, lower frequencies mean higher gains and less shift. Higher frequencies mean lower gain and more shift. Specific now for multi-capacity, shift can be zero to any degrees. This is similar to dead time. Um, but remember the, the four different ones here, and I'll scroll through them back really quickly because I think I've confused myself already. Uh, zero to any degrees for multi-capacity and extremely low input frequency will have no shift and the dynamic gain will equal a static gain. Again, perfect scenario. Okay, so that's this ILM. It's a, kind of a harsh introduction to um, loop dynamics. Um, but the, again, its main purpose was for us to explain how the uh, frequency of an input change uh, affects the output's ability to keep up, basically, is what it is. So again, uh, this is a pretty generic thing. Uh, the low frequency, high frequency thing applies to multi-capacity uh, first order and drawing a blank. Oh my God. Anyway, three of them. Uh, and not to the dead time. And then these particular ones are unique. So multi-capacity zero to any, let's just do this here again, integrating, that's the one I was missing, uh, is always 90. Dead time is between zero and infinity. And that's, that's basically this ILM in a nutshell. So I will see you another day. Goodbye.